there was a family, parents and their son, who were struggling because the son was basically a terror at school, hated going to school. There was no developmental issue or any reason why he was struggling in school. He just didn't want to go. Now, his parents were a Jewish family, and so they wanted to send him to a, the, the right school, but every time they would send him to a school, he would be dispe- dismissed, expelled. So they finally came to a point of desperation, and the parents went to their rabbi to ask for advice. And they were surprised when the rabbi suggested that they enroll him in a Catholic school. The father was shocked, and he said, Are you sure, rabbi? He said, yes. So they went and enrolled the son in the nearby Catholic school, and they took him his first day and left him in the hands of the nuns. And sitting on pins and needles, the first hour went by, no phone call, and then two, and then finally lunch came around, no call. And then three o'clock arrived, And the parents knew that he had made it through the day. Well, the son walked home from school, and he came in the door, and he greeted his parents. Good afternoon, Papa. Good afternoon, Mama. And then he went to the dining room table and sat down and began his homework. Well, his parents were amazed. And once they finally found their tongues, they asked him, what happened in school and why he was behaving so well. And the son looked up and said, Oh, Papa, when you left, Mother Superior told me that they do not allow rowdy boys in this school. And she took me to my classroom. And Papa, they mean business. They've got a Jew nailed on a cross in every room. (laughs) And it is true If you visit a Catholic or Orthodox, Lutheran or Anglican church, you are likely to see a crucifix, which is the image of Jesus, who was a Jew, nailed to a cross. Now, most Reformed churches have an empty cross, although there are some Reformed churches that have no cross at all. And the reason for the difference in these symbols is all rooted in what we say we believe. Those who display a crucifix focus on the depth of Jesus' suffering. And with Holy Week coming, that's an especially meaningful experience for those who carry that emphasis in their belief. Those who have an empty cross focus on the resurrection and Christ's victory over death, which is very much what you will hear in a Presbyterian church. However, if we were true to our founding father, John Calvin, we would have no cross in our sanctuary or in our building because Calvin believed that that was idolatrous. He rejected the position of the Catholic Church because they taught that they used those symbols because it was necessary to give the people in the pews symbols because they were not educated and they weren't able to understand God without them. And Calvin said, no, the reading of the word and the proclamation of the word is enough for God to work work and be heard and understood. I kind of like Calvin's position. But the symbol of the cross takes us to the very core of our Christian faith. We proclaim Jesus as the Christ, meaning he is the anointed one, the one who saves. What Christ did when he died on the cross is called the atonement in theological terms. A word that means that by dying on the cross, Christ repaired the relationship between God and human beings. So through Christ's death, we become at one with God. Atonement. At one meant. There are, however, a number of different ways of understanding how atonement works. People are often surprised to learn that there are at least seven different theologies of the atonement. In a Bible study in one of our previous congregations, I had mentioned these other views because we were looking at a Sunday school curriculum that was teaching one view of atonement and defining it as the definitive belief of the church. So I pushed a little on that. 
And a member of the class was quite surprised that I would challenge something so sacred. And so he said to me, then what does it mean when we say Christ died for us? How are we saved? That's what we're going to delve into this morning. What does it mean when we say Christ died for us? But before we can begin, I want to give you permission to disagree with any of the different theologies of atonement that I'm going to present to you. We don't have to agree exactly on who God wants us to save or how Jesus saves us. There are millions of people in the world who call themselves Christians and millions of people who call themselves Presbyterian, and we don't all agree. One of the things that I love about being Presbyterian Church USA is that we are very open to asking questions. And personally, I believe that we come to a much deeper understanding of God when we come together and we ask our questions and talk with each other. One of the great theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth, was one of those people that had written volume after volume of brilliant and complex theology. While he came, when he came to the United States for a visit, he was met by a reporter that I suspect may have been looking to trap him a little bit, wanted him to see, wanted to see if he could summarize all of the things that he had written in those volumes into one succinct sentence. Well, Bart thought about it for a moment, and then he replied, yes, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And so that is our starting point for today. Jesus loves us. God loves us. So what did happen when Jesus died on the cross? Well, as Bart said, the Bible tells us. It's just that not all of us understand the Bible in exactly the same way. So I want you to know that all of the different views that I am sharing with you are rooted and grounded in scripture with some cultural influences mixed in. So here we go. Some of the earliest church fathers expressed their belief in the atonement as the recapitulation or restitution theory. They believed that Jesus came to reclaim what Adam had lost. And so they emphasized Jesus' life as much or maybe even more than they emphasized his death. Because they said that by living the perfect life, Jesus had achieved victory over death. It's an interesting perspective. Other early church fathers had a view that was the dominant view for the first thousand years of the church. They called it the ransom to Satan theory. And they believed that because of Adam, and I'm going to throw in Eve because I feel like that's only fair. So because of Adam and Eve's early sin, Satan held human beings hostage and had to be paid a ransom to release us. Jesus' death was that ransom, and God accomplished this mission with a nice little tool. He hid Jesus' divinity from Satan. Then a little after 1000 AD, a church theologian named Anselm described what was called the satisfaction theory of the atonement, and it came to be called the penal substitutionary view. If you saw The Passion of Christ, Mel Gibson's film, you saw this theology on the screen. The basis of this view is that the sins of humanity were so great that human beings were not able to pay the penalty for their sin. Only God, through the sacrifice of his own son, could do that for us. So Jesus took our place in receiving God's demand for punishment so that human beings could be reconciled to God. That one probably sounds pretty familiar. A few hundred years after that theology was another viewpoint that was called the government theory of atonement. In this view, sin destroyed the moral government intended by God, and Jesus' death provided the basis for forgiveness and restored that governing. Jesus' death satisfied the demand for public justice, demonstrated what will happen if we continue in sin, 
So you're not off the hook. You caught that. If we continue in sin, this is what might happen to you. And he allowed God to deal mercifully with our sin. Another viewpoint is one that makes me chuckle at the title of it. It's called the modern view of atonement. What makes me chuckle is that it was developed during the Middle Ages by a French philosophical theologian named Abelard. The Chamber's Biographical Dictionary describes Abelard as the keenest thinker and boldest theologian of the 12th century. The church, by and large, rejected his view. But it was revived in more modern days and has become much more widely accepted. Thus the name, the modern view of atonement. Well, according to this viewpoint, Christ allowed, him, allowed himself, that's important, to die on the cross not to eliminate an arbitrary barrier to God's forgiveness, but to reveal to us the depths of God's love. So that in this understanding, God's love, um, because of this un, uh, God's love, we would want to repent. We would want to come to God in love, rather than coming to God out of a sense of guilt or fear. In this view, Christ's death was sacrificial, but not to pay a price. He sacrificed himself because his deep empathy for human beings was important. I especially wanted to share these viewpoints as we near the end of the season of Lent because, as Mitch had said last week and I think in a couple of other times, how we view God's saving work in Jesus Christ, how we understand God's work in the world, determines how we live as Christians. If we think of God as a a judgmental God who demands penal restitution, then we are likely to take that approach with people and be more judgmental and sit back and make judgments about which people are worthy of our love. If we believe in a God of grace, a God of unconditional love, then we are more likely to extend forgiveness to those who hurt us. Well, the idea of sacrificial love is truly one of the highest ideals that we hold as Christians. Sacrificing one's own life so that another person might live is, as Jesus said, the greatest love one person can show another. And Jesus certainly demonstrated this for us in his death on the cross. His death is a sacrifice that shows us the boundless love of God. Some of you who are on Facebook have friended me and know that I like to follow a lot of conversations of things that are happening in the Presbyterian Church and among my colleagues in ministry in the church beyond the Presbyterians. And so once this question popped up on my Facebook feed, it said, is there any person in the world or any cause that if circumstances called for it, you would be willing to die for? Well, The instant I read that question, I thought to myself, well, of course there is. I'm a parent. The easy answer to that question is, yes, I would do that for my children. It wasn't until later that I thought maybe I should include my husband on the list. (laughs) But my first reaction was that I would do it for my children, and I suspect that if we are honest, if we are parents, we would probably say the same. It's ingrained in our psyche that we take care of our children, no matter what the cost. And it turns out that there is a good chance that it's not just a mental attitude we acquire, but a physical connection as well. You might say, it's the way we're created. The bond between mothers and their children has long been described as spiritual, but born of biology. And so these scholars have been studying, and and they put together a group of mothers and non-mothers, put them in a room, and then put the sound of babies crying in their hearing. The response was not what they expected. Because what they found was that the non-mothers were the ones who had the strongest emotional reaction to babies crying. And the moms had a more subdued reaction. 
The non-mother's reaction stimulated the emotional center of the brain, but in the mother's, the reaction occurred in a different part of the brain that controls the surprise element, but not the emotion. The moms were disengaged from an emotional response. And what the scientists were saying is that by disengaging from emotions, we sometimes make better decisions. The study described a mother and a child as locked in a kind of reciprocal dance. The mom cannot go into a fight or flight mode all of the time. Sometimes a mom will react with a cool head and less emotion. And these studies confirmed that the mother-child connection is not just emotional, it's physical. Moms are neurologically programmed to be connected to their children. So suppose a house is on fire. The average person's fight or flight mechanism would tell them to run, get out of here. The fire is a danger to that person and the person's immediately, immediate physical well-being. So a non-thinking response is simply to run. If, however, the fire involved a mother and a child, the reaction might be different. And I say might because not every mother-child relationship is perfect. But suppose, again, a house is on fire, but this time there is a mom who is in a portion of the house who could make an easy escape where she is, but her child is in another room in the house, and behind, in the middle between them is a hallway with a lot of fire and smoke. That normal person's response might be to run away, get some authorities, bring in a rescue squad, and save their child. But the connection between a mother and a child tends to override that response. She's more likely to make the decision to save her child despite the danger to herself because it's worth the danger to save the life of the child she loves. I love that scientific theory because to me it just highlights how we are created. And all of this science can help us better understand our relationship with God. The description of a mother and a child locked in a kind of reciprocal dance is a wonderful way to describe God's relationship with us. We are locked in a reciprocal dance with God, interconnected and reacting to each other. So now I'm going to take it one more step. Let's apply that scientific view to Jesus and his crucifixion. We began this season of Lent remembering that Jesus went into the wilderness and he experienced the same kind of temptation and fear that we experience. We were reminded of the teaching in our creeds and confessions that says Jesus was fully human and fully God. So Holy Week is just a week away, and we're about to hear that story of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And some will remember I said he was sweating drops of blood in his anguish and stress, praying, God, if this is possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus could see the danger coming to him as clearly as we could see a fire burning in our house. And the normal response would be to run away. Let this cup pass from me. But Jesus was locked in a reciprocal dance with us, just as a mother is with her child. He would spent his ministry teaching the people a life of love and compassion for others and a love for God. And if he had given in to the temple priests and to Pilate who were questioning him, if he had denied his ministry, he would have abandoned his disciples, the people that he loved. He would have also abandoned God, as surely as a mother leaving a child in a raging fire. He would not do that. He could not do that. He could not deny the truth of what he had taught the people about God. God's unlimited grace God's love for each one of us. And so he chose to run into the fire, to put himself on a cross, an act of sacrifice for his friends, so that we might truly know the depth of God's love 
for us. It was not an easy act by any means. But what he did is the answer to the question, what does it mean when we say Jesus Christ died for us? It takes us right back to what Bart said. Jesus loves me. This I know. Say it with me. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Amen. <laughs>